Have you ever wondered how your computer's memory works? It's like the brain of your computer, storing and retrieving data as needed. But how is it organized? Well, just like a well-ordered library, the memory of your computer is meticulously organized. This organization is fundamental to the smooth functioning of any computing system, be it your personal computer, your smartphone, or even the servers that power your favorite websites. This systematic arrangement of memory is known as memory organization. It's an intriguing puzzle, a harmonious dance of data storage and retrieval, with each part playing a vital role. From the smallest register to the biggest hard drive, every component has its place and purpose. Remember, understanding the memory organization is like unlocking the secrets of a computer's brain. In the next few minutes, we will unravel the mysteries of your computer's memory organization. To understand memory organization, we must first understand the memory hierarchy. The memory hierarchy consists of different layers, each with its own characteristics and purpose. At the top of the hierarchy, we have registers. These are small, fast storage locations within the central processing unit or CPU. Registers store data that the CPU is actively processing. They offer the fastest access times but are limited in capacity due to their size and cost. A step down the hierarchy, we find cache memory. This type of memory is located between the main memory and the CPU. It stores frequently accessed data and instructions, reducing the latency of memory access. Cache memory typically comes in multiple levels, L1, L2, and sometimes L3, each with varying capacities and access times. Next we have the main memory, also known as RAM, which stands for Random Access Memory. This is where data and instructions that are actively used by the CPU are held. However, data in RAM is volatile, which means it's lost when power is turned off. At the bottom of the hierarchy is secondary storage. This includes non-volatile storage devices such as hard drives, solid-state drives, and optical disks. These are used for long-term storage of data and programs. While secondary storage offers large capacity, its access times are slower compared to RAM. Each of these components plays a crucial role within the system. The registers provide super-fast, immediate access to data for the CPU. The cache memory offers a speedy bridge between the main memory and CPU, reducing the time taken to access data. The main memory or RAM holds all the data and instructions currently in use, while the secondary storage offers vast amounts of storage for long-term use. Each component in this hierarchy has its unique role to play, making your computer efficient and effective. Now how does your computer know where to find the specific data it needs? That's where memory addressing comes in. Memory addressing is a bit like a postal system for your computer. Each piece of data is like a house, and it gets its own unique address in what we call the address space. This address space is the total range of addresses that your system can handle. It's like an incredibly large city, filled with millions, even billions of houses, each with its own unique address. Now you might be wondering how these addresses are assigned. This is where we talk about addressability. In a byte addressable system, each byte of memory gets its own unique address. It's like every room in the house having its own unique address. But in a word addressable system, larger chunks of memory, called words, each get a unique address. It's as if you're only assigning addresses to entire buildings instead of individual rooms. Each address in your system corresponds to a memory cell. Think of these cells as empty rooms waiting to be filled. Each memory cell can store a certain amount of data, typically 8 bits or a byte. However, it's not always as simple as throwing data into a room and closing the door. When it comes to multi-byte data types, the order in which the bytes are stored matters. This is what we call byte ordering. There are two ways we can do this, little endian and big endian. In little endian, the smallest or least significant byte gets the lowest address. Just like the smallest house on the block gets the smallest number. In Big Endian, it's the other way around, with the biggest or most significant byte getting the lowest address. It's like numbering the houses on a street from the biggest to the smallest. So memory addressing is like the map your computer uses to navigate the vast landscape of its memory. It's a complex yet fascinating system that allows your computer to locate and access the information it needs quickly and efficiently. Just as we have different types of storage in our homes, computers have different types of memory. Let's dive in to understand each of them. First up, we have RAM, or Random Access Memory. Much like a chef's worktop, it's a place for temporary storage during program execution. Its contents are volatile, meaning they disappear when power is turned off. 
there are two main types, SRAM or static RAM and DRAM or dynamic RAM, each with its own advantages. Next, we have ROM or read-only memory. This is the non-volatile memory that stores firmware and permanent data. Think of it as the recipe book that the chef can refer to but cannot alter. There are various types including mask ROM, PROM, EPROM, and EPROM. Then we have cache memory. This is like the chef's spice rack holding frequently accessed data to improve performance. It's a high-speed memory located between the CPU and main memory, acting as a buffer to enhance the efficiency of data exchanges. Lastly, we have virtual memory. This is an extension of physical memory provided by the operating system. It's like an extra storage room, allowing larger programs to run by using disk space as temporary storage. Each memory type serves a different purpose, contributing to the overall performance of your computer. From the chef's worktop to the spice rack, each type of memory has a role to play in the kitchen of computation. We've talked about where data is stored, but how does your computer access it? This is where memory mapping comes in. Memory mapping is the process that assigns physical addresses to memory locations. It's like the postman of your computer, making sure that every piece of data gets to where it needs to be. This process involves translating virtual addresses used by programs into physical addresses. Think of it like this. The virtual address is the name on the envelope, and the physical address is the actual location where the letter needs to be delivered. This translation is crucial because it allows the CPU to connect with the memory in a way that it understands. But memory mapping isn't just about data. It also extends to input-output devices, or I.O. devices for short. These devices can be mapped to memory addresses, allowing them to be accessed just like memory locations. This is known as memory mapped I.O. By mapping I.O. devices to memory, the interaction between the CPU and peripherals is greatly simplified. It's like having a direct line to the device, instead of having to go through a switchboard every time. Through memory mapping, your computer can easily and efficiently interact with its memory and peripherals. This simple yet ingenious system is what allows your computer to function smoothly and efficiently, ensuring that you can continue to watch videos, play games, or just browse the internet without a hitch. The way your computer accesses memory is crucial for its performance. Let's explore memory access modes and interleaving. Memory access is not a one-size-fits-all process. There are three primary modes that a computer can use to retrieve data. Random access, sequential access, and direct access. Random access is a bit like a game of hide-and-seek. It allows the computer to go directly to any memory location, regardless of its position. This is most commonly seen in devices like RAM, where each memory cell has its own unique address and can be accessed independently. Sequential access, on the other hand, is more like reading a book. You start at the beginning and work your way through to the end. This is the mode of choice for devices like magnetic tapes, where data is read or written in a linear fashion. Lastly, there's direct access. This is the middle ground between random and sequential access. It allows direct access to any block or record, but within those blocks or records, the data is accessed sequentially. Now, let's move on to memory interleaving. The principle behind this is simple. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. By distributing data across multiple memory modules or banks, the computer can access different data simultaneously thereby improving the overall memory access bandwidth. There are two types of memory interleaving, interleaved memory and bank interleaving. Interleaved memory scatters data across multiple memory modules, allowing for simultaneous access. Think of it like a relay race, where each runner is a memory module, passing the baton, or in this case, the data, from one to the next. Bank interleaving, on the other hand, divides the memory into banks that operate independently, by alternating between banks, the computer can read from one bank while the other is preparing the next chunk of data. It's like having multiple chefs in a kitchen, all preparing different parts of a meal at the same time. By using different access modes and interleaving, your computer can maximize its memory performance. We've covered a lot of ground today, haven't we? We've journeyed through the memory hierarchy, from the swift registers to the vast secondary storage, We've navigated the realm of memory addressing and explored the varied types of memory. Our adventure also took us to the fascinating world of memory mapping, and we've discovered the different modes of memory access and the concept of interleaving. So the next time your computer boots up or loads a program, remember the intricate memory organization at work behind the scenes?